Hello, Fiendlings, how the hell are ya? The Black is currently on hiatus until October, so I needed something to fill the feed. What I chose is the 2011 original presentation of my first novel, Closet Treats. Closet Treats made up the bulk of the indie published collection Fiends, along with Tattoo and the short story Canvas. While Tattoo brought a lot of folks to my feed in the early days, Closet Treats is more memorable. To this day, I still get pics of creepy ice cream trucks from all over the world. Also, certain folks can't hear two songs without immediately picturing portions of this novel. I'll take it. Now, this is a far more adult novel than the Black series or even Gare's Inferno. This one deals with mental illness, serial murder of children, off-screen, I promise, and other uh, nicely horrific scenes. Therefore, I'm going to say it again. This presentation contains adult situations, adult language, violence, and gore. Listener discretion is advised. I've said it twice. You've been warned. With that, I'm out of here, and I hope you enjoy. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode one of Closet Treats. Chapter One The brilliant crisp sunlight was dying. A light breeze caused the pines and oaks to wave their limbs in some incomprehensible rhythm, the occasional oak leaf separating from a branch to fall and flail in the wind. Trey stood at the edge of the schoolyard, patiently waiting. The bell would buzz in a few moments, and a tidal wave of children would burst through the school's doors. Trey smiled to himself. This was his favorite part of the day. He always left the house a little early to pick up Alan from school. It was one of the many rituals that allowed him to retain a sense of normalcy. Other parents had shown up, mostly in their cars, but a few women stood at the edge of the grass. He didn't know their names. They never spoke to him or returned his hellos. In this day and age, ignoring your neighbors seemed to be the rule rather than the exception. He didn't move his head to look at them. He learned from past experience that trying to make eye contact was asking for a rebuke. What the hell ever happened in neighborhood solidarity, for Christ's sake? How long until the school bell buzzed and children came out? Trey fought the urge to pull out his phone and check the time. He normally didn't notice the minutes pass while waiting for the buzzer. Only after the bell did his mental clock start keeping track of the seconds. Once, a few months ago, the buzzer had sounded and Alan didn't appear within the first couple of minutes. The anxiety that took him that time nearly knocked him out. A steady horror film of his son, his fucking son, being molested by some teacher in a back room kept playing in his mind. He had tried to shake it off, to make it go away, to end the horror loop. But it kept playing, and the longer it played in his mind, the more textured it became. Sound effects of crying and chuffing, a loose belt jingling on a tile floor. Just as he began running for the school's back doors, Alan had appeared, turning and laughing when he saw his father. Alan had needed to pee before the walk home. A cacophonous blaring of bells split the fall afternoon. Trey shook with a start. His eyes swiveled to the left. What he saw made his jaw drop. A white van covered in decals, just visible through the copse of pines, sat at the road facing the playground. Two speakers jutted from the top of its roof, ushering forth the brash, crisp bells. Trey blinked. The driver's side window was tinted nearly black. He felt a stab of fear as the large van trembled slightly and a side panel opened. From this distance, he couldn't quite make out the figure inside, just a glimpse of a white uniform and a pointed hat. The school bell buzzed. As if on cue, a cheer rose from the school doors, and Trey turned to watch as a mob of children ran out, book-stuffed backpacks swaying. Trey couldn't help but smile, remembering what it was like at that age to finally leave the school day behind, looking forward to play, to dinner, to be children. The ice cream van's bells pounded louder, silencing the children in one fell swoop. The mob stopped for a moment, as if unsure of what to do. Trey watched as one of the elementary school children, older and a little round across the middle, pointed to the van and started running toward it. Dozens of children followed. The mob moved off toward the van, leaving several stragglers behind. They watched their classmates, 
a little confused as to what to do. Trey was glad to see Alan was one of the stragglers. Alan turned from the site and looked over at Trey. The smile on the boy's face melted the tension in Trey's stomach. His boy. His son. Trey nodded to him, and then Alan was in motion, his little legs pumping. The boy jumped into Trey's waiting arms. Hi, Dad! Alan all but screamed. Missed you, kiddo. Trey breathed into his ear. You ready to walk home? Yes, sir, Alan said back to him. Trey patted him on the back and put him down. Alan raised his arm, offering his hand to Trey. Trey took it, as he always did. Daddy? Alan asked. What is that? Trey followed Alan's outstretched free hand. He was pointing at the throng of children in front of the white van. They giggled and laughed as they shouted orders at the white-clad figure. Trey watched children digging into their pockets for change, passing coins and dollar bills into a white-gloved hand. That, Trey said, is the ice cream man. Alan turned to him. But it's getting cold for ice cream, isn't it? Trey laughed. He sells candy, too. Oh, Alan said. But why is the music so loud? Fighting the urge to curse, Trey took a deep breath and let it out slowly. (sighs) "'Because he wants to make sure the children know he's there.' Trey paused and then muttered, "'Them and the rest of the world.' Alan shrugged. "'Candy? Ice cream?' He looked up at Trey, a half-smile on his face. "'Can we get some one of these days?' "'I think we might could do that, kiddo,' Trey said, and tousled the boy's hair. "'Come on,' Trey said. "'We've got some card to play.' Alan giggled. Yes, sir. I'm ready to run you over. Good deal, Trey said. They began walking down the sidewalk. With each step, they moved closer to the parked van. They would be perpendicular to it when they finally crossed the street. Trey looked down at his son, happy to see the boy wasn't even looking at it. Instead, Alan was recounting his day, telling his dad every detail. Trey barely heard him. He couldn't stop staring at the van. Trey looked into the darkness behind the open panels. A pair of yellow eyes gleamed back at him. Yellow eyes. They cast a baleful glow that lit a face of scales with sharp, blood-dripping fangs. The thing was smiling at him as its misshapen, gloved hands took money from the children and passed out sweets in return. Trey froze, his mind vapor-locked. Daddy! Alan's yell broke through the mental scream rising up within him and Trey looked down at the boy. Daddy, are you okay? Alan asked, his face filled with concern. Trey licked his lips and cleared his throat. He wasn't sure he could speak. Um, <clears throat> He started and then stopped. He shook his head and refocused his eyes on his son. I'm, I'm okay. With his free hand, he rubbed Alan's coarse, short-cropped hair. How long? Alan shrugged. Just a little while this time, Alan said. Home? Yeah, Trey agreed. He smiled at his son. Yeah, sorry about that. He lightly squeezed the boy's hand. You take good care of your old man. It's a full-time job, the boy said. Laughing, the two of them made their way past the street. Alan told Trey more about his day, occasionally asking questions about history that his teacher had glossed over. Trey did his best to keep up, although he couldn't shake the image of the van and its occupant, but he at least managed not to ice up on the way home. Chapter 2 The walk home always gave him the chance to talk to Alan without interruption or distraction. Those conversations left Trey feeling like a good father to a great son. As they reached the front door, that confident feeling faded. Get out your key, Trey said to Alan. The boy stared up at him and blinked. Yes, he said. Your turn to unlock the door. Alan smiled at him. He plucked off his pack and rummaged through the front pocket. Trey grinned. You got toys in there too? Alan smirked. No, Daddy, no toys. Just, he said as he lifted the key ring out of the pocket. Lots of pins and things. Trey cocked an eyebrow. Things, he asked. And what would those be? The key fit into the deadbolt with a little resistance. Alan frowned. He looked back at his father. Trey shrugged. 
With a sigh, Alan managed to turn the key until the lock clicked. I have some change in there, Alan said as he struggled to release the key from the lock. A little pencil sharpener? Alan grunted as the key popped out from the lock. He turned back to his father and smiled. And the charms Mommy gave me. Ah, Trey said as Alan opened the door. Alan walked through, holding it open for his father. Always the little gentleman, Trey said with a smile, and followed him in. The boy smiled back and headed toward the living room. Shoes, kiddo. Alan sighed. Yes, Daddy. With his back to Trey, he pressed down on the left shoe's heel and followed with the right. The boy was always pushing off his shoes, ruining the heels. Alan placed his shoes on the shoe tree near the door. Trey shook his head, bending at the waist to untie his laces and removed each shoe with care. He placed them on the shoe tree next to Alan's. Okay, kiddo, you have any homework to do? Alan shook his head. Go spark up some cart and I'll be there in a few. The boy giggled. I like playing, but you're going to lose to me again. Trey laughed. Then give me Koopa this time. Maybe then I'll stand a chance. Alan shook his head. Right, he said, drawing out the syllables, and scurried into the living room. Trey watched him go and then headed into his study. The computer screens were dark. No LEDs flashing. The room silent. Trey walked in, slowly lowered himself into the Aeron chair, and pressed the power buttons on the monitors. The dual 24-inch widescreen monitors flashed into life, bathing the room with an electric glow. Trey checked his email, laughing at the responses from Bangalore. Those guys really hate me, he said to the screen. An email in the box was from Dick, and he opened it. The email contained a picture of Trey, wildly off balance, his long hair flowing in the wind as he threw a frisbee down a hill. Dick's email read, Want to get your ass kicked again tomorrow? Dick. Jesus. He hadn't spoken to Dick all day, and that was a rare day. He'd been so wrapped up in the code, his iPhone alarm was the only thing that had kept him from being late to meet Alan for the walk home. Dick, the retired neighbor across the street, always kept his messenger client going, but Trey hadn't bothered to even start his today. A chatter from India had gotten to the point where he just didn't want the damn thing on anymore. He wrote back a response to Dick, promising to be ready at 10 a.m. As usual, when Dick talked schmack in an email, Trey didn't respond in kind. He knew it infuriated Dick when he didn't acknowledge the trash talk. But every once in a while, Dick would send an email with no rude words or arrogant statements. That's when Trey would pounce, sending back all the schmack he could muster. Daddy, Alan called from the living room. Trey sighed. He put the computer back to sleep and turned off the monitors. The study immediately went dark. Trey turned in the chair to leave and stopped. The closet. The closet door was partially open. A sudden chill left him goose-fleshed and freezing. His heart rate rose, the sound pounding in his ears. Daddy! Alan called again. Trey froze. A green light burned in the sliver of absolute darkness, a smooth oval of emerald malevolence. It would come out of the closet. It would grab him, drag him screaming into its lair. It would... Daddy! Alan said from the doorway. Trey looked away from the closet to his son. The boy's face was cloaked in shadow, but Trey could see the worry lines on his forehead. Are you all right? I... Trey looked from him to the closet. The green light was gone. Can you uh, turn on the light, son? Trey asked in a shaking voice. Alan reached down and flipped a switch. The black halogen torch in the corner of the room blazed and chased away the darkness. Trey took a deep breath and then walked toward the closet door. He grasped the doorknob, let out the breath, and then opened it. Plastic drawers with computer parts stared back at him. Cables and cords wound neatly together, hung from the door's back. There was nothing in there. No monster. Nothing. Trey chuckled, but it sounded more like a sob. He pushed the door closed, making sure the bolt slid firm. Okay he breathed. You can turn off the light now. Okay, Daddy. The torch went dark, driving the room back into gloom. Trey stared at the door. The fear had left now. You still want to play cart? Alan asked. 
Trey turned back to look at the boy. He smiled at him. Give me Koopa? Ellen sighed. Okay, Daddy, but I'm still going to kick your butt. Just try it, he growled, and Zombie loped toward his son. Ellen squealed and ran from the room, Trey's laughter following close behind. Chapter 3 Thirty minutes of cart, as Alan liked to call it, was enough to leave Trey feeling nauseous. Trey knew they called his generation the video game generation, but he was one of the few that suffered from squims. 2D graphics games were fine, the kind where the world stayed relatively static, but the 3D lifelike games where the world bounced and spun always managed to get to him. Alan had called him chicken for leaving the game after the third battle races, Trey had clucked and pumped his arms up and down, laughing as he made his way into the kitchen. It was time to cook dinner anyway. He pulled out the pasta, placing it on the kitchen island. With an ease born of repetition, he opened the freezer and scooped out the white container of sauce. Another turn, another grab, and a frozen sausage sat atop the cutting board. Pasta. Sausage. Trey's famous sauce. Oh yeah, this was going to be a good dinner. The sauce thawed on the island, leaving him time to cut up the sausage. He reached for the Cutco cleaver from the butcher's block and sliced neatly through the plastic package. The sausage unfolded from the wrapper with effort. Once naked and on the board, he picked up the knife and began cutting it into pieces. Quick, sharp, diagonal cuts. The sausage quickly turned from coils of brown and gray meat into neat, oblong pieces. He smiled as Alan yelled in the other room. He'd either won or lost. It didn't matter. It was Friday night, and that meant Alan was free to play. It also meant he and Carolyn would be free to play. As he prepared water for the pasta, he looked up at the microwave screen. The soft green display told him it was 1700. Trey blinked at the numbers and frowned. The green. The closet man. He'd been seeing the closet man as long as he could remember. Its eyes were always the bright, verdant color of a burning emerald. He couldn't believe he'd forgotten to close the closet today. He'd managed to open it and rummage through it, but only after he turned all the lights on in the study and adjusted the lamp so that it spotlit the door. God, he hated closets. But forgetting to close the door all the way... He shook his head. One thing the meds never seemed to do was dispel the closet man. Trey waited for the water to boil and walked to the pantry. Carolyn had insisted on removing the pantry door shortly after they moved in. She quickly tired of Trey jumping every time he walked into the dark kitchen and found it open. He opened the bread box and removed a loaf of French bread. Garlic bread. He looked back at the clock to check the time. Yeah, he thought. I have time. Parmesan cheese. The real stuff, not the crap from the can. Roasted garlic cloves left over from preparing his last batch of sauce. Another knife from the butcher's block. He minced the garlic, enjoying the smell as the water started to boil behind him. He prepared the bread, covering each side of the split loaf with cheese and then shaking the garlic over it. Into the oven. Pasta into the kettle. Sausage into the pan. Add sauce. Daddy! Alan called from the living room. You're making me hungry. Good. We'll eat as soon as Mommy gets home. Okay, Alan said. But I'm going to tell her how badly I beat you. I'm sure you will, Trey yelled back, smiling. Besides picking up Alan from school, this was his favorite part of every weekday. Cooking, playing with the boy, unwinding. He looked back at the microwave display, watching the timer tick down. Green. The eyes in the ice cream fan. They weren't green. They had been cat's eye yellow, glowing with crimson centers. Trey frowned as he stirred the sausage, listening to it crackle in its own grease. He'd have to tell Kincaid about that next month. The sauce was bubbling. Trey inspected the sausage, nodded to himself, and drained the pan. He combined the sausage and the sauce, stirred in some fresh oregano, and turned down the heat. Simmer. The pasta would be done in a few minutes. Same with the garlic bread. The sound of the garage door opening made him smile. Guess who's home? Trey called to the living room. The electronic chatter from the game stopped with a beep. 
He listened to the sound of Alan's feet on the wood panel floor as he ran into the kitchen. Hey, Trey said, slow down before you slip and bust your butt. Alan laughed and scrambled into the laundry room. When the door to the garage opened, Alan screamed, Boo! Carolyn screamed in mock terror and then started laughing. Trey just nodded to himself, continuing to stir the sauce. Where is my dinner? Carolyn said as she placed her arms around his neck. Almost ready, he said. She stood on her toes and kissed his cheek. He chuckled. Then she bit his ear. You better stop that, he said. The cook is on the clock. Well, hurry up. You have more cooking to do later. Her hand squeezed his ass. Work, 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 Trey said. Chapter 4 The words on the page had started to blur. Alan knew he should close the book and turn off the light, but he fought against sleep. Harry Potter and his friends were getting ready to battle the basilisk, but that's not why Alan wanted to stay awake. He loved the book, but he'd already read it twice. He needed Daddy or Mommy to kiss him goodnight. Just having them walk in the door and touch his cheek, smile at him, was enough to protect him for the night. Alan shook his head, trying to clear it, and then rubbed at his eyes. He glanced at the digital clock in the nightstand. 9.30 glowed on its display. Any minute now. Please. He looked across the room to the closet. The door was closed. Alan smiled. The closet man. Alan didn't worry about the closet man. Alan had other things to worry about. Daddy's seizures were happening more often now. The one today had been bad. Mommy and Daddy had told Alan that he needed to try and keep track of the time when Daddy had one of them. It was important. If Daddy's blank time was longer than a couple of minutes, he needed to find an adult, and fast. When he was five, Daddy had blanked at the playground. Alan was sitting on a swing, learning how to pull on the metal chains to give himself momentum, learning how to pull forward on the chains to stop. Daddy was watching him from a bench. Alan was giggling, rising higher and higher into the air. When he called to his father, there was no response. When Alan turned to the left to look at his daddy, he'd seen the vacant stare. Daddy was sitting on the bench, elbows on his knees, head cradled on spread hands. His eyes were staring straight at Alan, but unmoving. Daddy, Alan had called to him. Other kids on the playground, moving through the wooden jungle gym or crawling through the metal web, had been oblivious. Alan had slowed the swing enough to jump off. Daddy didn't move. Daddy... Alan had asked again, but Daddy didn't respond. Alan had made his way over to the bench and stood directly in front of his father. He tapped Daddy's shoulder. Daddy didn't move. Daddy? Alan started counting. When he reached ten, he held up a finger on his right hand. The next ten, he put on another finger. He was to his thumb when Daddy lifted his head. Daddy? You're not... Daddy raised his eyes to Alan. Um, he said. He shook his head, wiped a line of drool from his face, and then smiled at Alan. Hi, he whispered. You blinked, Alan said. Yes, I I guess I did, Daddy said. Daddy was smiling, but Alan, even at that age, could tell it was forced. How long, kiddo? Alan held up his hand. Five fingers, ten each. Daddy nodded. Okay, he said. He shook his head once more. I I want to see you swing some more. Are you okay, Daddy? His father nodded, the smile wide but still strained. Yes, Alan, I'm, I'm okay. Daddy stared at the swing set. Another child was already sitting on the swing Alan had been using. Daddy frowned. Guess you lost your spot, kiddo, he said. Sorry about that. Alan shrugged. He really wanted to get back on the swing. It wasn't fair another kid had taken it. He wouldn't say it, though. He knew it would make Daddy feel bad. It's okay, Daddy. I was tired of it anyway. They walked home after that, both of them sweating in the too hot sun. The seizures, or blanks, as Daddy called them, were becoming more frequent now. Alan would never tell Daddy that he worried about that. Some days, when in school, he imagined his father walking to the school or back home, standing on the sidewalk, unmoving. Would Daddy fall to the pavement? 
Would he fall in front of a car? Alan shivered at the thought. A squeal from the stairs interrupted his thoughts. Alan cocked his head to one side, listening to the sound. Light steps, almost inaudible over the churning of the heater. Alan smiled. You coming to tuck me in, Daddy? His father's head peeked into the room, a wide smile on his face. I have come, he said as he stepped through the doorway, arms outstretched, legs stiff as he marched toward the bed. To tickle! Alan squealed as his father descended upon him, fingers lightly pressing against Alan's sides. Gotcha! Daddy yelled in triumph as Alan collapsed into giggles. Daddy stepped back, smiling. Alan's laughter slowed. You ready to go to sleep? Yes, Daddy, Alan said. Good, because I have more tickling to do. Alan flinched, and Daddy laughed. Not you, kiddo. He put a finger to his lips. Shh, he whispered, looking around as if someone might hear him. I'm going to go tickle Mommy. Alan giggled again. Daddy reached out a hand and rubbed the boy's head. Now, he said, go to sleep. Daddy bent down and kissed Alan on the forehead. Yes, Daddy, Alan said. His father stood back up and shook his head. He mouthed, I love you, turned and walked out of the bedroom, closing the door behind him. Alan let out a sigh and snapped off the lamp. The room descended into darkness. Daddy's kiss would keep him safe from the whispers. It always did. Chapter 5 Carolyn lay against Trey in the dark. Her head curled against his shoulder, her body pressed close against his hips. His right hand absently stroked her hair, playing with the strands. So, she said, did you have a good day? Trey's fingers stopped amid caress. He felt her stiffen against him. Um, he said, um, yeah. He forced his fingers to start the job again, but he knew it was too late. What's wrong, baby? He shook his head in the dark. I, well, I, I had a seizure today. Blank? She asked, her voice flat. Yeah, blanked. How long? Trey shrugged in the dark. Alan said it was only a little while, less than a minute, I guess. What set it off, honey? She asked, holding him tight. I, he stopped. The ice cream man, those yellow eyes staring at him from the van's shadowy interior. It's, um, it's stupid. She pulled herself up and rested her head on an elbow. She bit her lip, her brown eyes staring into his. You don't get to do that, Trey, she whispered. Fuck, I, he said. I, I know, it's just, just tell me, baby. She reached out with her free hand and brushed her fingers against his cheek. Just tell me. Okay, he breathed. He closed his eyes. There's an... There was an ice cream van at the school today, he swallowed. I saw eyes inside the van. Inside the van, she asked. He opened his eyes and looked at her, an embarrassed smile on his face. Yeah, stupid, I know. You mean all you saw were eyes driving the van? Trey sighed. No, baby. The side door slides and the guy hands the treats out over a little counter. So you saw him in the shadows of the van? Yeah, Trey agreed. Only I, I saw those eyes. Carolyn nodded. Do you know what it was? <laughs> Me being a fucking psychotic? Carolyn laughed and then shook her head. That's not what I meant. She twirled a finger in his chest hair. Do you know why you saw that? He opened his mouth and then closed it. You don't get to do that, Trey, she whispered. She bent and kissed his lips. Just say it. It was like the closet man, he said, feeling a flush on his face. Only, it wasn't. Did it scare you? He nodded. Yeah, it did, but not in the same way. Okay, she said, kissing him again. Can you talk about it yet? No, need to think about it. She smiled. Oh, that's going to be a problem, she said, because you're going to be busy. Her hand brushed against his inner thigh. He moaned. Very, very busy, she chuckled and kissed him again. 
Chapter 6 She listened to the wind buffeting the house. Her body pressed close to Trey's. As he slept, his breathing was barely audible, above the ebb and flow of the skeletal tree branches clacking together. Sleep may have taken him, but she had been awake for the last hour. Another seizure. Trey was having more and more of those lately. It was why he didn't drive. Although he knew how to drive a car, he never had in their ten-year marriage. She didn't expect she'd ever see that happen either, especially now they had a child. But the seizure didn't bother her as much as the closet man. She shuddered in the darkness. Trey had always been afraid of closets. When they first moved into the house, she wanted to put all their clothes in the closet in order to save space in the bedroom. Instead, they ended up compromising. All his clothes were kept in a chest of drawers in the bedroom, while all her clothes ended up in a closet. She had never understood his fear of them, a childhood fear that had managed to seep into adulthood. It was silly, of course, a grown man afraid of dark and closed spaces. He'd even removed the door of the master closet and moved it to the garage. She knew if he had his way, none of the closets in the house would have doors at all. She readjusted herself against his body. He let out a little moan and pressed back against her, as if making sure she was still there. Carolyn smiled in the darkness. Trey, her lover, the father of her child, her husband. She loved him but didn't understand his phobias. She guessed she never would. But seeing the closet man in the real world, that was... new. She shivered. Had that precipitated the seizure or the other way around? More questions for Kincaid. Maybe next time Trey went to see the doctor, she'd go with him. She could call Kincaid, of course, and let her know, but didn't like the idea of going behind Trey's back. Trey was self-conscious enough about his mental illness as it was. The Closet Man. A pair of eyes that stared back at Trey from dark, enclosed spaces. Green eyes. Always green eyes. Except for today. She frowned. Something was changing. Whenever Trey saw the closet man, he ended up freezing in place, but conscious. He'd call for help, or he'd just stand there, too afraid to speak. Their son knew all of this. They taught him about Trey's idiosyncrasies at an early age. He knew what to do when Daddy blinked, or when Daddy froze in front of a closet or other dark place. Alan knew. At eight years old, he knew as much about Trey's condition as she did. Alan. She placed an arm around Trey, hugging him closer to her. Would her son start having the same mental problems? How long before he too wouldn't go near a closet? How long before he started seeing things or freezing up during stressful situations? She hugged Trey tighter. In the darkness, he sighed. Carolyn closed her eyes again and floated. She listened to the rhythm of Trey's breathing and felt her own match it. Within a few minutes, she was finally asleep.